Okay, today we're going to talk about the Gospel of Thomas, and I'm actually, I should tell you, recording this from home, so why I'm telling you that is uh, it is completely possible you will hear one or two of my cats uh, throughout this lecture. They get a little jealous when I'm not paying any attention to them, so you might hear them climbing on me or you might hear them meowing, so I apologize for that. Um, but if you have cats, um, it's you know how they can get when you're not paying any attention to them. Uh, I, I, I don't think there's a really good way to approach the Gospel of Thomas. What I mean by that is, I, it, for some people, it is best for them to listen to uh, this lecture on the Gospel of Thomas before reading the Gospel of Thomas. For others, uh, it's best for them to read the Gospel of Thomas and then listen to this lecture. Uh, Either way you do it is fine with me. I am sure, though, like most people who come to the Gospel of Thomas, that uh, you will have more questions after this lecture and after reading the Gospel of Thomas uh, than you will have answers. And that's because the Gospel of Thomas represents a form of Christianity that nobody is familiar with anymore. The Gospel of Thomas, historically, is part of something that we now call the Nag Hammadi Codices, or the Nag Hammadi Books. Uh, codices is a uh, fancy word for books. And the Gospel of Thomas itself is part of the Thomas literature that comes out of the Nag Hammadi Books, or the Nag Hammadi Codices. We will talk about Nag Hammadi uh, a little later on here in this lecture. But one of the reasons why I have you read the Gospel of Thomas in a course on Jesus is because the Gospel of Thomas illustrates just how diverse early Christianity was 2,000 years ago. Or in the case of the Gospel of Thomas, which was written in the second century, 100 years after the death of Jesus. Uh, if you just look at the Gospel of Thomas and you learn a bit about it, you realize that the Gospel of Thomas represents a completely different type of Christianity that is not found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Uh, and the reason for that is because Christianity, ancient Christianity, was extremely diverse, just like modern Christianity is extremely diverse. Just to illustrate some of this, uh, some ancient traditions among early Christians, uh, there, there were some ancient traditions that suggested Thomas was the twin brother of Jesus. Now, that seems odd to a lot of us. Uh, for many people, that just seems like an utterly blasphemous statement. But the name Thomas means twin, in a uh, ancient language called Syriac, which is a version of Aramaic, and there are still some Christians that uh, speak Syriac, and there are Syriac Christians still in the, in the world today. Uh, and Thomas also means twin in Aramaic, which is the, the language that Jesus and his disciples spoke. Uh, Thomas is also in the canonical Gospels, identified, mysteriously identified as the twin, but we're never told the twin of whom. Uh, but in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 24, and chapter 21, verse 2, uh, Thomas is called the twin. We just never hear from John, well, who's the other twin? The Greek word didymos, if you're looking at my notes, it's D-I-D-Y-M-O-S, pronounced didymos or didymos, also means twin. So when you come to the Gospel of Thomas and you open the Gospel of Thomas up, one of the first things you read is that the Gospel of Thomas was supposedly written by Didymus Jude Thomas. Uh, Jude, or sometimes it'll say Judas. Jude is the uh, anglicization of Judas, which is the Greek for Judah, which is a very, very Jewish name. <laughs> Excuse me. Allergies. Some early Christian traditions uh, identify Thomas as uh, 
the author, in fact, of a very small letter in the New Testament, a letter called Jude, which it all relates back to this tradition of Jude being Judas being Judah. So there were some early versions of ancient Christianity, they're just not versions we're familiar with today, that believed Jesus had a twin brother. And some of those versions, like we'll see here with the Gospel of Thomas, thought his twin brother was Thomas, or Thomas, or Didymus Jude Thomas. Now, there's all kinds of fun little things we could do with this, and uh, what some people have done with this in Hollywood, like with the Da Vinci Code or another movie called Stigmata, um, this is also somewhat the case, not entirely with Martin Scorsese's film, The Last Temptation of Christ. But if this is true, it would mean that there's still this Jesus DNA uh, in the world today, that there's still somebody that has that DNA, that family line, going back to Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, and you could have that through... Uh, his twin brother, if his twin brother went on and had children or something like that. Well, a whole body of literature grew up in ancient Christianity that was associated with Thomas and this whole tradition of Thomas being Jesus's twin and so on and so forth. There's a text explicitly about Thomas in the Nag Hammadi corpus called the Book of Thomas. There's also a text called the Acts of Thomas, which is based on uh, Greek romance novels. Thomas literature was also very, very popular in places like Syria and Mesopotamia. That would be modern-day Iraq. This has led some scholars, I really have no... Um, opinion on this one way or the other, but this has led some scholars to suggest that there might even have been something like a school of Thomas in places like Syria and Mesopotamia, perhaps headquartered at Edessa in Syria. In fact, there's a fairly strong tradition that says the disciple Thomas established Christianity in India, that after uh, Jesus died, that what he did while uh, Peter was going to the Jews and Paul was going to the Gentiles. Uh, Thomas just packed up and went east and ended up down in India and established Christianity there. In fact, if you travel to India today, this is the story that you'll be told and you'll be shown places, uh, in particular a cave, you'll be shown where this is where Thomas prayed. And yes, Thomas came here and Thomas brought us Christianity. Uh, and there, there might really be a lot of truth in that tradition. Uh, it would explain, it's, it's certainly an explanation for how Christianity made its way down into India. Uh, there's also a fun little book associated with Thomas called The Infancy Gospel of Thomas. Uh, and it, it, it has nothing to do with, with Thomas and, and uh, the young years or the youthful years of, of Thomas. It actually has to do with Jesus. Uh, it's an interesting, it's, it's text, it's this interesting text about who was Jesus when he was a kid? What was he like when he was a teenager? And the, the whole text is this fanciful mythological text, but it's, it's, it's a text that, that interestingly shows Jesus to kind of be a little bully when he was a kid, uh, a show-off and a bully. Uh, one of the things that uh, the infancy gospel of Thomas, uh, one of the stories it likes to tell is about Jesus making these clay pigeons come to life and impressing everybody with that and with his ability to do that. Um, and then there's these other stories in which Jesus strikes one of his school teachers dead because the school teacher criticized his homework. And then there's Another story about a child who bumps into Jesus on the street and Jesus is so mad at this child, he strikes him dead, but then Jesus feels bad and he's persuaded by others to raise him back to life. Um, so some of this Thomas literature is, again, it's fanciful mythological literature that's just telling these kind of 
weird little made-up tales. Uh, but the Infancy Gospel of Thomas is one of these strange little texts in which you get uh, somebody's thoughts about Jesus as a child and Jesus as a teenager, and yet uh, it, it presents Jesus as, like I said, a kind of a bully, a jerk, and a, and a show-off. Uh, what this does is it doesn't really tell us anything about the historical Jesus, but it tells us that people were, were becoming interested in those lost years of Jesus, uh, what, 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 what did he do, um, you know, from the time that uh, he was 12, 13, all the way up to the time when he uh, began his public ministry, when he was an adult, when he was an older man? Now, not all of these Thomas texts represent the same kinds of Christianity. Some come from various ascetic forms of Christianity that put a great deal of emphasis on uh, not eating certain foods or ascetic forms of Christianity that emphasized um, celibacy. Others represent more radical forms of Christianity. And many of these Thomas texts, and we need to talk about this at some point, which we'll do in this lecture, many of these texts betray the influence of a philosophical movement that scholars today call Gnosticism. And part of why the Gospel of Thomas is so hard for people to understand is because people read it and they've never heard of this philosophical movement known as Gnosticism. Um, so we'll have to come back to that, but Gnosticism is something that early Christians had to deal with. It was a heresy for many of the early Christians. So let me, before we get into all of that, talk a bit about the Gospel of Thomas. Let me start by talking about the discovery of the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas was discovered in 1945 in Egypt near a village called Nag Hammadi, which is why uh, the Gospel of Thomas and all these other books and manuscripts that were discovered at Nag Hammadi, this is why they're, they're called the Nag Hammadi codices, the Nag Hammadi books, or they're sometimes called the Nag Hammadi corpus to say this is the Nag Hammadi body of literature. Um, the whole discovery of the Nag Hammadi text was by utter, complete accident. Uh, this is very true with most archaeological finds in the modern world. Uh, basically what happened, believe it or not, is there was an Egyptian peasant and his brother that uh, were digging for clay. And believe it or not, uh, one of the names of one of the Egyptian peasants was Muhammad Ali. And while they were digging for clay, they stopped and they started throwing rocks around. Uh, and one of the rocks went into a cave and they heard a jar break open. And they went inside and they investigated and they saw inside of this jar 12 leather-bound books. And among the 12 leather-bound books or codices, there were also fragments of a 13th. Now, the rest of the story is, is fascinating and, and part of it is, is kind of frustrating, but they took these leather-bound books back to their home and they showed them to their mom. And the, the way the story is, is told by Muhammad Ali and his brother is that their mom started throwing some of the books on the fire because she thought they were useless, but they, they, would, uh, they would burn well in the fire. And apparently they were uh, uh, short on wood. Uh, so who knows what was actually burned up um, because... Uh, Muhammad Ali's mom thought this would be a good idea to burn some of these books while she was making supper that night. Uh, anyway, all of these documents survive in a language known as Coptic. Uh, there are still Coptic-speaking Christians in the world today. In fact, in Egypt, there are Coptic Christians. Uh, Coptic Christians are part of the Coptic Orthodox Church. They are not well known in the United States, but they are certainly well known in Egypt. But even though these documents survive in the Coptic language, most of them seem to be uh, 
uh, translations of Greek originals. Uh, Coptic is this strange language um, that is a combination of Greek and certain Egyptian languages like Demotic. Uh, so even though these documents from Nag Hammadi are in this Coptic language, uh, it, it, most scholars are convinced that the, these Coptic documents are copies of Greek documents. So we, we, we don't have, for instance, a, an original Greek copy of the Gospel of Thomas. What we have is a Coptic translation of a Greek original. And all of these texts from Nag Hammadi seem to date from somewhere in the second century. So again, a uh, uh, hundred years or so after the death of the historical Jesus. The Nag Hammadi codices were put together, or at least it seems that they were put together, around the year 350 CE, and they were buried in a sealed pot outside this village called Nag Hammadi. Scholars think um, some Christians buried these texts because they were afraid of Orthodox Christians wanting to destroy these texts because they thought the texts were heretical. Um, that may be true. I think that's a possibility, but it's just a possibility. Uh, we really don't know why these texts were buried. We really don't know why they were hidden. More importantly, at least for our purposes, is the fact that unlike the Gospels in the New Testament, unlike Matthew, unlike Mark, unlike Luke and John, Thomas is a different type of gospel because Thomas isn't a narrative gospel. Uh, if you've read it or when you read it, you, you realize very quickly if this is just a text made up of sayings of Jesus and there is no rhyme or reason moving you from one saying to the next saying to the next saying to the next saying. So scholars will talk about Matthew, Mark, Luke, John as narrative gospels. But Thomas is a sayings gospel because there's no narrative to it. And when Thomas was discovered, uh, when the Nag Hammadi texts were discovered, scholars were really excited about this because it lent some credence to this idea that scholars had that there might be this Q document out there that Matthew used and that Luke used, which were just sayings of Jesus. So Q, if it's ever found and if it, it exists, it, it might look similar to the Gospel of Thomas. So Thomas is made up of 114 sayings. These are called logia uh, in Greek. So it's 114 sayings of Jesus. They're in no particular order. You could read it saying 1 to saying 114. You could start in the middle. You could start at the end and go all the way back to number 1. And usually you cite Thomas by saying, the Gospel of Thomas saying 1. The Gospel of Thomas saying 2 all the way down to 114. Now it's important to keep in mind that even if Thomas was written in the 2nd century, and it was, it's, it's possible that some of what we have in Thomas, some of these sayings from Jesus, might go back to the first century. And it's also possible that in Thomas, we might have a more original saying from Jesus than what we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And this is why historians who work on the historical Jesus, this is why they're so interested in Thomas today. Because you can use Thomas to say, well, well wait a minute, are, are there some sayings in here that we don't know about that might actually also go back to Jesus? Or are there some more original versions of sayings of Jesus that we already know that are in Thomas? Um, that, that are more original than the version of the sayings that we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And what, what's often confusing for people when they read Thomas is that there are a lot of sayings in the Gospel of Thomas from Jesus that sound similar to the ones you find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
Like I said, sometimes Thomas's version of those sayings are more primitive, um, sometimes not. And sometimes, as people have often discovered, certain sayings from Jesus in Thomas are just absolutely strange and bizarre. So let, let, let's talk about the sayings of Thomas for a bit. Thomas begins with this really strange line. And so let me give you my translation here. These are the obscure or hidden sayings that the living Jesus uttered, which Didymus Jude Thomas wrote down. And he said, whoever finds the meaning of these sayings will not taste death. A very strange way to begin a gospel. In fact, what's so strange about the Gospel of Thomas is that, unlike Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, here's a gospel in which the author right away tells you who they supposedly are. Now, the word obscure is a Coptic word. Uh, it's also a Greek word that means hidden or secret. This should tip us off right from the beginning that we're dealing here in Thomas with some kind of mystical, esoteric lore. In other words, this is literature, not written for outsiders, not written for the masses, but it's written for insiders who are part of a particular group. Now, we might wonder, uh, if someone is writing these secret sayings down, just how secret are they? It's kind of like secret societies. It's like skull and bones at Yale of like, this is the most famous secret society in the world. So how secret is it when it's that famous? Still, there, there's a larger question here. And that question is, why in the world would Jesus teach secretly some secret sayings, some hidden sayings, to some of his disciples and not to others. Also, another big question, why does the reader of Thomas need to find the obscure meaning or meanings of Jesus' words? Why doesn't Jesus just plainly tell us what we need to know? The point here is that we are dealing with a very, very different kind of Christianity when it comes to the Gospel of Thomas. This isn't the world of Matthew. This isn't the world of Mark, Luke, Acts, John. Uh, in fact, what's going on here in Thomas is you don't find salvation by believing, having faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus. You find salvation in Thomas by learning these obscure hidden sayings and the meaning to these obscure hidden sayings of Jesus. Now, again, this sounds so weird to us because we don't know anything like this today in modern forms of early Christianity, but uh, this was important to a lot of Christians. This kind of thinking was very, very important to a lot of Christians back in the second century. Well, as I've already pointed out, there's no narrative to Thomas. But you might also have picked up on, if you've read Thomas or if you go to read it, you, now you'll see this. There is no birth story in Thomas. There is no discussion about the resurrection of Jesus in Thomas. There, there is no passion narrative in Thomas. The big things that are really part and parcel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John are missing in Thomas. Some have even suggested that the Jesus in Thomas is already in some sort of resurrected, enlightened state, and that's why he sounds the way he sounds in this text. In other words, he's, he's this wise teacher He's enlightened like the Buddha, and he's passing along hidden knowledge in his resurrected form. Uh, that 
may be the case, it may not be the case, but what, what often puzzles readers of Thomas today is that some of Jesus' sayings sound pretty much, if not exactly, like those we find in the canonical Gospels, and others don't. So let's look at one of the sayings of Jesus and Thomas, saying nine. Jesus said, Listen, a sower came forth, took a handful, and cast. Now some fell upon the path, and birds came and picked them out. Others fell upon rock, and they didn't take root in the soil and didn't send up ears. And others fell upon the thorns, and they choked the seed, and the grubs devoured them. And others fell upon good soil, and it sent up good crops and yielded 60 per measure and 120 per measure. Now, this is a parable, essentially. That sounds more or less like parables found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 3 through 9, Mark chapter 4, verses 3 through 9, Luke chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. In fact, the version in Thomas might even be the more original version of this saying, of this parable, because the Thomas version is simpler and more straightforward. Also, in the Synoptic Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, an elaborate interpretation is provided of this parable, and it doesn't seem to fit the meaning of the parable. And Thomas doesn't provide an explanation or an interpretation of the parable. So this is a case here, saying nine, where Thomas might actually have something right that, or more original than what we find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Right before Jesus tells this parable in Thomas, he says uh, in saying eight, what humans being resemble, human beings resemble is an intelligent fisherman who, having cast his net into the sea, pulled the net up out of the sea, full of little fish. The intelligent fisherman, upon finding among them a fine large fish, threw all the little fish back into the sea, choosing without any effort the big fish. Whoever has ears to hear should listen. Now this parable isn't exactly like a parable found in the canonical Gospels, but it makes a point that's very similar to some parables in the canonical Gospels. Uh, it's similar to a parable in Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 through 46, where Jesus talks about a wise person who casts away pearls of lesser value in order to keep the one pearl of great value. But if you listen to the nuances in Matthew's text versus Thomas, in Matthew, the good and bad pearls represent good and bad people, while in Thomas, the fish seem to represent human beings that have intelligence and human beings who don't have intelligence or enlightenment. Furthermore, Thomas's parable ends with whoever has ears to hear should listen. And this also sounds like a very common phrase that Jesus uses in the canonical Gospels. Now, there's a bunch of other sayings in Thomas that are just absolutely baffling and difficult to understand. One of these is saying 30. And saying 30 goes this way. Jesus said, where there are three divine beings, there they are divine. Where there are two or one, I myself dwell with that person. I have absolutely no idea what this means. And a, a lot of scholars who work on a saying like this are baffled by what does this mean? It kind of sounds like Matthew 1820, in which Matthew writes, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am among them. But the Thomas statement is saying something different, clearly saying something very, very different from the statement in Matthew. Some have wondered if the three is a reference to the Trinity. That really doesn't seem to be the case, but people have wondered that. Here's another saying 86. Jesus said, foxes have their dens and birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head and gain repose. Now, at first, this sounds on the surface like 
what Jesus says in Matthew 8, verse 20, and Luke uh, chapter 9, verse 58. But the part about gaining repose is very, very different because what that's about is something mystical. It has this mystical tinge to it. This has something to do with that obscure knowledge that Thomas talks about in the opening to the Gospel of Thomas. Now, one definite way that Thomas is absolutely different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke in particular, but also in some respects John, is that Thomas doesn't present an apocalyptic Jesus at all. There is absolutely nothing in Thomas, no interest in Thomas, in a future coming of the kingdom of God. There isn't a Jesus like you find in Mark chapter 13, talking about the imminent end of the world. That's just not there in Thomas. Uh, In fact, saying 113 is a very important saying in order to see this. His disciples said to him, when is the kingdom going to come? Now that's a question that the disciples of Jesus ask him a lot. In fact, when we get to... Luke Acts, this is at the opening of Acts, this is a question that even after Jesus is resurrected that his disciples are still asking. Jesus responded, it is not by being waited for that it, the kingdom, is going to come. They are not going to say, here it is, or there it is. Rather, the kingdom of the Father is spread out over the earth and people don't see it. Well, here in Thomas, the the kingdom isn't some eschatological future event that comes with the coming of the Son of Man. Instead, it's something that's already here, and it's spread out over all the earth. So Thomas's kingdom of God is this non-eschatological kingdom. It's this kingdom that's present, and it's here right now. Something else that's odd about the Gospel of Thomas is the role of Thomas himself in this Gospel. When people read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, especially uh, Matthew and Luke, they get the impression that Peter is the most important disciple. But in the Gospel of Thomas, Thomas seems to be the only disciple who really gets what Jesus is doing. In fact, he's the holder of the secret hidden knowledge that Jesus doesn't even share with Peter, with James, or John. In saying 13 of the Gospel of Thomas, we we have this. Jesus said to his disciples, Compare me to something and tell me what I resemble. Simon Peter said to him, A just angel is what you resemble. Matthew said to him, an intelligent philosopher is what you resemble. Thomas said to him, teacher, my mouth utterly will not let me say what you resemble. Jesus said, I am not your teacher, speaking only to Thomas. Uh, and he's talking here only to Thomas. And you, This is much clearer in the Coptic than it is in English. I am not your teacher, for you have drunk and become intoxicated from the bubbling wellspring that I have personally measured out. And he took him, Thomas, withdrew and said three things to him. Now when Thomas came to his companions, they asked him, What did Jesus say to you? Thomas said to them, If I say to you one of the sayings that he said to me, you'll take stones and stone me, and fire will come out of the stones and burn you up. Uh, Thomas is basically saying to the other disciples here, Oh, I could tell you what he told me, but then I'd have to kill you. I mean, that's sort of the ancient, Thomas is doing here is the ancient form of that more modern saying. And uh, this whole discussion that Jesus is having here in Thomas in saying 13, this is similar to the Christological question that Jesus asks in Mark. Uh, in Matthew and Luke, who do you say that I am? Well, what's different here in Thomas is that 
Peter and Matthew give good answers, but the answers aren't great. Thomas gets it right. And what we also see here in Thomas is, is, is we, we see that there was a hierarchy among the disciples. And in fact, that there was a disciple, Thomas, that Jesus would, would pull away and tell the truth to. So if you think of the Gospel of Thomas this way, um, the Gospel of Thomas is, is basically telling us that there's a kind of two-tiered knowledge system out there. There's one for the public followers of Jesus, your basic followers of Jesus, all followers of Jesus. And then there's another level, which is the more select secretive knowledge, which is only for the elect few. Well, to try and put some of this in context, we need to talk about that philosophical system called Gnosticism. Before we do that, um, let me explain some terminology that historians of early Christian, of early Christianity use. So if you're looking at my notes, um, we're going to talk about proto-orthodoxy, orthodoxy, heterodoxy, heresy, and Gnosticism. Um, these are much more uh, dreadful sounding words than they actually are. So let me start by giving you some explanation and uh, uh, definition to these words. When historians talk about Orthodox Christianity back in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th centuries, they aren't talking about Russian Orthodoxy, Greek Orthodoxy, Coptic Orthodoxy, Ukrainian Orthodoxy, uh, all these other Eastern Orthodox types of Christianities that, that you see today in the world. Um, they're, they're, they're thinking of small o Orthodoxy. They're not thinking of a denomination or a church. The word orthodoxy is a word that simply means the right way of thinking, the right way of doing something, or the right way of praising God. That's all it means. The opposite of orthodoxy is something called heterodoxy. If you are engaging in heterodoxy, you don't think the right way, you don't believe the right way, and you aren't praising God the right way. And if you fall into the heterodox category, you are committing heresy, which simply means that you think differently from the majority opinion. Now, historians have to divide the ancient Christian world up into these categories of Orthodox Christians and heterodox Christians. Uh, if you went back 2,000 years ago, give or take 50, 60 years, and asked people, are you Orthodox? They would have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, th these are labels that modern historians use to put certain groups into certain categories. Uh, but they're, 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 for all their flaws, they're, they're terms we have to use to try and explain, well, who fits into what group. So let me, let me start slowly here talking about Gnosticism. Because Gnosticism is going to fall into the uh, realm of heterodox, heterodoxy and heresy. Gnosticism comes from this Greek word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. And the Greek word gnosis means knowledge. That's all it means. What's so difficult about Gnosticism is that not all Gnostic Christians were heretics. In fact, uh, 
Clement of Alexandria, around 200 CE, who is anything but a heretic, who's considered one of the great champions of orthodoxy and proto-orthodoxy, he thought of himself as a Gnostic Christian. Now, all he meant by that is he thought, well, Christianity is a religion that's based on knowledge. But for him, the knowledge was the death and resurrection of Jesus. It wasn't some sort of secret or obscure or hidden knowledge. But he did believe that there was a kind of public knowledge and then there was a type of esoteric knowledge for more mature Christians. So you could even have good Orthodox Christians like Clement of Alexandria using this term Gnostic, and they certainly weren't heretical at all. And, and this is why this term, term Gnosticism, is, is difficult and confusing, even down to this day. Well, as far as historians today can figure out, it looks like some later Christians started referring to some heterodox Christians, some non-Orthodox Christians, with this epithet, with this slur, with this title, Gnostic Christians, who engaged in Gnosticism. Now, originally, like I said, this was a neutral word, but eventually it, it was a word that meant if you're a Gnostic, you're a heretic. You don't think the right way. Gnosticism is not a monolithic thing. What I mean by that is like Christianity and Judaism, there are multiple forms of Gnosticism in the ancient world. So if you went back in time, if that was possible, you would never, uh, you, you, you couldn't just go, you know, okay, okay so, so are you a Gnostic or not? Uh, people wouldn't understand that. Uh, over the past 20 years, there are some scholars of Gnosticism that have even thought of dropping this whole word. Now, that would create utter chaos if we did that. Uh, but uh, they've got a point because you, you can't go back to the ancient world and go, hey, where's the Gnostic church? You're, you're, it, it, it doesn't work that way. And in fact, not everything that was discovered at Nag Hammadi fits into the category of Gnostic or a Gnostic text. Well, for, for our purposes, we should think of this term Gnosticism as a term which identifies a constellation of beliefs, assumptions, and texts that have much theologically in common with one another. So if you held to this constellation of beliefs, then you didn't fit with what certain Christians believed. Now, when we're talking about second century orthodoxy, uh, we often call that proto-orthodoxy. Uh, actual orthodox Christians that would, would be the, the, the ones who, who, who won, the ones who said, we're right, the rest of you are wrong. You have to get to the 4th, 5th, 6th centuries for all of that. You have to get to things like the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Ephesus, and all these other sorts of things. So what scholars do when they talk about um, Christians who are Orthodox in the 2nd century is they often call them proto-Orthodox Christians uh, because they're laying the groundwork for what will, will later become Orthodox Christianity. So if you you held to this Gnostic constellation of beliefs, then you don't fit in with what other proto-Orthodox Christians in the second century believed. So this makes you a heretic and it makes you a Gnostic. All right, so what is Gnosticism? Well, some early Christians had been influenced by a number of ideas that went all the way back to the Greek philosopher Plato. Now, Plato isn't a Gnostic, but some Christians uh, started adopting and adapting some of the ideas of the Greek philosopher Plato. Uh, these same Christians wanted to read the Bible through the philosophical ideas 
and lenses of Plato. Well, Plato's writings put forth a kind of philosophical theology that posited many gods, as any Greek would, but ultimately one supreme divinity. So even though there were, was this pantheon of gods and goddesses, there was a supreme divinity at the top of all of this. This true divinity, the supreme divinity of Plato, is beyond anything mere mortals, mere human beings, can conceive of. So Platonic thought, Platonism, taught that, but it also taught a dualism of the body and the soul. And it taught a hierarchy of the material universe versus the spiritual universe. In fact, uh, Plato taught that the body was the prison of the soul. That the true essence, the true person, is not the material created being that you can touch, that you can feel. It's the spiritual person. It's the soul inside of that material. So what this means is Anything that is spirit is good. Anything that is created matter is bad. Now, some Christians started picking up on this platonic thought. And it's likely this combination of platonic thought with Christianity that created Gnosticism. So Gnosticism is taking these Platonic ideas and it's basically just running with them. So Gnosticism created a mythology. Uh, and in, in one of the Nag Hammadi texts, uh, there, there, there's a text called The Secret Book According to John. And in this book, we, we find Gnostic mythology. We find a cosmology about the creation of the world from a Gnostic perspective. And this is going to sound very, very strange, so just bear with me here for a second. The secret book, according to John, says that there was a God, not the supreme divine being, but that there was a God called Yalda Bo. Uh, Ba'oth. Yalda ba uh, Ba'oth is not the supreme divinity. He, he is a lesser god. And Gnostic mythology associated this god with the Jewish god in the book of Genesis. Now, in Orthodox Christianity... everybody would say, well, wait a minute, the, the Jewish God of Genesis is the father of Jesus. So people would say Yahweh, um, the, the Old Testament God, the Hebrew God, the Jewish God, that's the father of Jesus. Well, Gnostic mythology has a whole different thought on that. So this Yalda Ba'oth, which is kind of code for the Jewish God Yahweh. Uh, Gnostic mythology comes along and says, the world as we know it was created by this Jewish creator God. And it's an imperfect world, at least according to Gnostic mythology, because it's made of created matter, material matter. But material matter is not true because it's spiritual stuff. It's spiritual matter that's true. So... The secret book, of, book according to John is saying the world as we know it was not created by the one supreme divine being. It was created by a lesser God. And in fact, it's a prison. Uh, this Gnostic mythology in the secret book according to John also goes on and says that this lesser God, 
created other divine beings like angels and demons. Eventually, that lesser God created Adam. And the creation of Adam and the body of Adam became the prison for the true self, the soul. In Gnostic mythology, Gnostics are saying that they are entrapped in the materiality of the body. Uh, in fact, it's a bit more complex than simply talking about a soul because what Gnostic mythology says is that there was a fight in the divine realm between this lesser God and the one true God. And during this fight, sparks from the one true God fell from the divine realm into the created world. And these sparks, these sparks of divinity, entered into the bodies of certain chosen individuals. Some people have these sparks of divinity with, within them. And those sparks need to go back to the one true God, not to this lesser God. But they're trapped inside of bodies, inside of created things, thanks to this lesser God. Well, one way you release these sparks, these divine sparks, is through gaining gnosis, through gaining secret knowledge. And that's essentially what Thomas is trying to tell us, is you gain this secret knowledge in order to find true salvation. Now, of course, you don't know if you have this spark or not. Uh, you only would know it after learning this secret knowledge. Now, I know that's not going to make complete total sense of Thomas, but it, it hopefully will... Um, clear up maybe one or two things about Thomas, but as I said, it also opens up all these other avenues for questions and ideas. But let me just conclude uh, by saying that what, what Thomas, the gospel of Thomas does is it shows us a type of Christianity that most modern Christians are, aren't familiar with anymore because uh, it's, it's Gnostic Christianity is just not something we, we, we've encountered. Um, I would point out to you, in fact, the translation of the Gospel of Thomas that I've provided from you comes from the Gnostic society. There are a group of people uh, in the United States and throughout other parts of the world today in the UK that think the Gospel of Thomas got it right and Matthew, Mark, Luke, John got it wrong and they're trying to restore uh, a Gnostic Jesus to uh, Christianity. And so Gnosticism actually does exist in the world today, ironically. But what, what Thomas really shows us is the diversity of early Christianity. Uh, and it sounds so weird to us because it's just not something we're familiar with, but it's something that uh, uh, people would have been familiar with back in the second century. I mean, if you want to think of it this way, if you plop a good Baptist into a Catholic church and they've never been to a Catholic mass... Uh, Catholicism is going to look real weird to a Baptist, just like if a Catholic goes to a Baptist church, it's going to look really weird. Um, it just depends on what you're familiar with and not familiar with. What we also find with Thomas is we find that there were Christians in the ancient world that didn't care about Jesus' birth and they didn't care about apocalypticism. They didn't care about the coming kingdom of God, and they didn't care about Jesus' death, and they didn't care about his resurrection. Instead, they thought of Jesus as a kind of enlightened wisdom teacher. And in some cases, they, they thought of him as the person who came to free us from the evil creator God and get us back to the one true divine being. 